What's going on guys, Pepperbelly back again. Today I want to talk about the fatigue system in a little bit more detail because obviously there's like a lot of debate, <laughs> like a lot of debate. People are still talking about it and they want to talk about like, you know, what's realistic, what isn't realistic. And you know, you have arguments from both sides that are pretty valid. So, you know, everyone's got their opinions, everyone's got what they want to say. So I'm going to be looking at this more from like, I guess you could say more of a mechanical side. If that makes any sense just just the main just the, the main mechanics of how things should theoretically work in the real world i know that sounds kind of weird and you'll, you'll get to what i'm talking about in a little in a little bit once i start explaining things a little bit more in depth so one of the things someone asked me is like you know for example doing a in in england it's called a tab or here in canada we call it a bft which is basically the battle fitness test and i'll be referring to the canadian standards when i talk about this so, the battle fitness test is comprised of a 13 kilometer ruck march with roughly 50 pounds of gear on you. You have to go 13 kilometers in 2 hours, 26 minutes, 20 seconds. That's, you have to adhere to that. If you don't, you're considered unfit and you can no longer, you know, do infantry stuff. So, you have to complete that. You get a 10 minute break. Then you gotta do a casualty drag. So, you gotta drag casualty for so so many meters and then you gotta i think it's like 20 or 30 meters or 50 meters could be wrong don't really remember exactly the specifics of the casualty drag and after that you have to do a trench dig and you get 10 minute breaks in between each one so you have to be able to do that if you can't do it then you're considered unfit as a soldier and you're unable to basically you have to get in shape if you want to continue being an infantry soldier so looking at the times we're going to be talking about not casualty drags or the trench dig obviously since you can't exactly do that in Arma 3, obviously you can get mods to, you know, drag casualties and stuff, and Arma 2 it had it, like, default, I don't know why Arma 3 doesn't, but basically I'm talking about the speed in which you require to do it to pass, and this virtual arsenal is actually a very great way of displaying if you're capable of not, or capable of doing it without actually going to do it. I was actually planning on sitting down for a few hours and literally doing a real BFT in the game. I was thinking of going for Stratus, because basically the southernmost point of Stratus all the way to the northernmost point is roughly 12.5, 12.9 meters, or kilometers, sorry. So, roughly, roughly what it would take. So, the pace to actually make exactly 2 hours, 26 minutes, and 20 seconds is 5.33 kilometers per hour. So as you can see right now, when you're running, this is 14 kilometers, I'm sprinting, it's 18. If I want to do the tactical pace, if I bring up my weapon, it's 10. And if I put down my weapon, it's 11. And if I walk, it's 4. So you can see that walking the BFT in Armor 3 isn't viable because it's only 4 kilometers per hour. I will probably come up short, right? I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't know the exact numbers, but basically I would not meet the timing. That's essentially what that is. So if you were to do a combination of the two, so if I'm, you know, running with my weapon down. Doing a tactical pace or whatever, you know, going 11 kilometers per hour. My fatigue level is increasing, right? Not too bad. And in fact, just so most of some of you guys actually know, I'm not sure if all of you are aware of this. Having your weapon up makes your fatigue quicker than if you put it down. If you put it down, it's a little bit slower. You can actually see it in the fatigue bar right now. 47, 48, 49. I bring it up. 49, 50, 51, 52, 53. You can see it's a lot quicker, right? It makes a difference having your weapon down. So, moving forward, you know, I'm starting to slow down. My pace is getting a little bit worse. I'm at 9 kilometers per hour. Theoretically, I can just start walking the 4 kilometers, and you'll actually see my fatigue starts to drop. So, 4 kilometers is a little bit short of the 5.33 required to maintain the entire 2 hours, 26 minutes, 20 seconds to adhere to the timing. But if you were to just to do a combination of the two, so, you know, you run for... A good distance, you know, 500, 100, 500, 500 to, you know, a kilometer, just doing that, 500 meters to a kilometer, sorry, I'm kind of, kind of out of it today, boys, but, uh, yeah, so that's basically, you know, it's, a, it's viable, because then I can just slow down, go to four kilometers, let my fatigue level drop, you know what I mean, slow down, slow right down, and let my fatigue drop to a reasonable level, and then continue the pace again, and then slow down because there is no speed in between, right? It's kind of unfortunate. There is no like I'm moving at 5.33. Otherwise, you can theoretically 
you know, do the BFT for real at the exact time that it requires you to do it at, or the exact speed minimal you need to do it at. So, the, the gist of it is, the fact that I'm walking at 4 kilometers per hour and the fatigue level is dropping. I'm recovering while I'm doing this. And I'm still moving at 4 kilometers. So, I don't have to do the entire BFT to realize that this soldier is entirely capable of with this static, you know, default loadout, what you would actually have. I have more weight in my character right now than I actually would. You can see my load is 72%. That's more weight than I would actually have doing the real BFT. And my fatigue level is dropping. Basically, I'm recovering, even though in real life you, you wouldn't really, <laughs> you'd still, it wouldn't feel like you're recovering if you want to put it that way. But four kilometers, you're recovering, it's, you're walking and your fatigue is dropping. And then you can pick up the pace again, your fatigue starts going, you're moving at 11 kilometers. So I don't have to do, basically the bottom line is I don't have to do the entire BFT to realize that it's entirely feasible for him to make that timing based on the, the information I'm given right now. You know what I mean? The speed he can move at, the speed he can recover at, and continue moving at that speed, and then slow down again. It's, it's entirely manageable to make that BFT timing. So in that, in and that of itself is actually feasible and realistic in terms of his, you know, his physical fitness level and being able to perform it. So the other thing I would want to talk about is basically engaging targets while being and utterly and brutally fatigued. So what I actually ended up doing, I'll go back here. I created a loadout that is just ridiculous. So <laughs> he looks stupid, right? He's a wetsuit, tan ja or a tan flak vest and whatever and bag and all that stuff. So this is like what are you what are you looking at basically? Well, this is the maximum amount of weight I can actually throw and distribute on this character. So if I'm going to use a site. So we'll do actually we'll we'll rock this first. Okay, so I'm at 100% load. You know what I mean? If I were to actually alter the scope, so if I were to put a sniper scope on this thing, like the LRS or whatever the hell that thing was called. <laughs> Sounds so legit, boys. I can't even remember the names of things. But yeah, so I would be at 101% load. And basically I'm going to keep running around like this until I get super tired, until I hit 100%, and then I'm going to start to engage a target at 1 kilometer. So 500 meters, and then start shooting at a target at 1 kilometer. Guys are probably thinking like, what? That's impossible. I'm using the MX rifle. And I'm going to start shooting at a target. That's exactly... Wait, is this the MX or the MX-1? It is the MX. Okay. So yeah. And I'm going to start engaging a, a target at 1 kilometer. It's... Just so you know, there's going to be a ton of sway. Right? It's a, it's a kilometer distance. I'm aiming at something that's really tiny at a kilometer. I'm not going to hit it efficiently. Just know that. I'm going to have to compensate. I can kill it, and I have done it, and I will kill it. That target. So I'm at 100. Here we go. Super tired. Cool. This is great. Change the sighting to 500 meters so I can engage that target immediately, which you can kind of... You can see them way the hell out there, but anyway. And when I go in the prone, my fitness level, my fatigue will not be dropping, so it'll pretty much stay at 100. So if I zoom in, there's a target. Okay, so there you go. There's the one that's way the hell out there, a kilometer. There's the 500 meter target. There you go. 500 meter target has been eliminated. Switching to the 900 kilometer distance. Or 900, 900 meters, 900 kilometers. Right. <laughs> It'd be like impossible to... There you go. Kilometer target eliminated. With 100% fatigue and 100 load. Like, it's feasible. It's not like you're saying that it's an utterly... Those people who are saying it's utterly impossible to make those shots. It's like, I, ju I just did it right now. With an MX rifle, 6.5 millimeter. Alright, that's... It's... it's. I don't know how to... That, that right there is enough to kind of just show you guys that... The, yeah, there's sway, but it's entirely manageable. You can still... Like, I just killed a guy a kilometer away. Think about that. That's such a long distance. Considering you think of the maximum effective range of a 5.56, five, which is 300 meters, maybe 400. And if it's in a platoon, the maximum effective range of a C7 in a platoon size is 600 meters. I just killed a guy with a 6.5 millimeter at a kilometer with 18 rounds to spare. With 100% fatigue and 100% low. So, 
the point is, you know, I can keep altering my stuff around. So if I go in here, for example, and I put, I don't know, maybe you're like, oh, I want to see a different scope. So here's the LRPS. Okay, cool. Still super fatigued. You know, can maybe different scopes have different sways? You know, that, that could be a thing. Oops, it's not even changed. What the hell? Hang on. Give me a second. This is being weird. Okay, equip it. There you go. Try. Okay, so here it is. 100%, 101% load. That's like a whole extra percent higher. That's just, that's crazy. So here we go. Start engaging this target. Wait, is that a fine? Yeah, okay. Oh, wow, one shot. One shot at 500 meters. He's dead. So there's the kilometer target. 900 meters. So it's a little bit harder, which is natural. It's completely normal. I mean, I'm firing around at over about a kilometer away. It's a little bit less than a kilometer. That's why I went zeroing at. Actually, maybe I'll put it to a thousand. Yeah, you can see those rounds are like way. Yeah, so you can see the, the tracer rounds way out there. Now they're flying over his head. So, so we're back down to holy crap. <laughs> See, as soon as I bring up the weapon, it's like, whoa, it's all over the place. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. There you go. Now he's dead. Kilometer away. 100% fatigue, 100% load, different scope, same weapon, MX. Not the MXM, the MX. Standard rifle. So, yeah, I will be... Okay, I'll, t I'll definitely touch on one thing here, and some of you guys are probably like, you're not even noticing the one thing that doesn't make any sense. You're in the prone. Why the hell is my fatigue not dropping? Probably what you're thinking. And, yeah, you're right. I will agree with you on that. Why isn't it dropping? I'm just laying here, right? Theoretically, I should be recovering from weight, but, in essence, to a degree, there is some element of realism here, and that's basically how the weight is still on you. It's, st it's still laying on top of you. You'd be surprised how difficult it actually is to move around with this much weight just laying on top of you and then having to get up from that position you know what I mean? I can attest, I know a lot of people can attest, like, you know, you're carrying all this crap and then getting up is like, oh, my knees, oh my god, oh, okay, let's go. <laughs> and then once you're in the standing position, it's a lot easier, but once you're down here having to pick up the weight, it's like, it's like doing some kind of crazy squat, right? You're lifting a lot of weight, a lot of weight. So, here's a way of, you know, recovering, I guess. You could say this is cheap, but technically this is kind of what you would do in the real world. You'd put your crap on the ground. It's sit it down to alleviate the weight of your body, the stress that's on your body, and oh, okay, now my fatigue's recovering. You know, we have quick release straps on rucksacks for a reason, right? It's kind of not entirely dangerous, but if you're trying to remove a lot of weight off your back and you're just taking it off like a regular backpack, you can injure yourself. That's why you have a belt buckle, you unbuckle that, and you pull the release straps so they just fall directly to the ground to prevent injury. There's a lot of weight, right? So now I'm recovering. Basically putting the ruck on the ground, and then I can just go ahead and re-equip the ruck. And the launcher. And then, fatigue obviously isn't going to continue to drop. It's a lot slower once you're actually having the weight, but you got to realize it's a lot of weight on you. Okay, like, I'm not trying to be like, it's impossible, you can't do this. You can, right? Every, it's a different level of conditioning and, and endurance. You know, some people want to make the argument that, okay, I am more than capable of sprinting, like, 30 kilometers and you know my shorts and t-shirt and running shoes it's like that's terrific okay like i personally can run in regular civilian workout clothing pretty damn far well no probably not anymore because i've been you know i'm kind of out of shape now not gonna lie but the point is when i was you know in my prime in my prime when i was on course and doing training and all that stuff we were able to run you know 10 kilometers and just you know that equipment no problem as soon as you throw on a tack vest, put on combat boots, and you're wearing a little bit of extra weight, that, that can actually change significantly. That whole feeling of, I can run forever, now feels like, holy crap, this is a little bit more difficult. And that distance feels a lot harder to actually make. The added weight definitely comes into play here. And adding a launcher. Okay, in Canada, we have the Carl Gustav. It's a, we call it the Carl G. It's an 84 millimeter recoilless rocket launcher. Alright, that thing, carrying that, 
It's not super heavy, but if you put a round in that and then you're carrying in your rucksack ammo for it, yeah, that's going to bog you right down, believe it or not. I know a lot of guys who, you, if you're carrying that, it's like, yeah, this is heavy shit. This is, this is heavy gear. It's not, you know what I mean? Like, you're not running all over the place. Contrary to popular belief, whenever you're on patrols and stuff, are you running everywhere? Are you advancing the contact by running? Typically, no, you're walking. Walking is a viable way of actually getting around with that much weight. But running, you, you, I know like a lot of people who play games, I understand like one guy put it and it was a really smart way of putting it. And that's basically the fact that when you're carrying or when you're playing a game and you're running around, the element of speed is different, right? The, the, per, or the interpretation of speed is different. So what I'm seeing in the game, you know, it's kind of annoying. Nobody wants to walk around everywhere, you know, vi realistically, if I was on patrol, I'd be walking like this, you know, just really casually, slowly going about my business, maybe get in a vehicle or do something. This is how I would be. You know what I mean? This is exactly how it would be. You're not running everywhere. You're not sprinting everywhere. Only once you're in combat, you're doing that. And you got to realize there's such things as adrenaline that kicks in. And when you're being shot at and you're actually, you know, in fire and you're having to maneuver and stuff, adrenaline will generally take over. And there's people I know who went overseas who would say, you know, when they got in serious firefights, their adrenaline would be like through the roof. They would feel like superhuman beings. But then they'd crash for 48 hours because the amount of adrenaline that pumped through their system was just so much that their bodies became insanely weak after the fact. So it's, you got to realize, you know, as much as you people, as much as you people, as much as you guys want to criticize the realism of what this actually is, you got to realize it's not, it may not be 100% realistic. The argument I'm making is that it's in the realistic area. If there's like a graph of unrealistic, realistic, it's in between the realistic of 100% like authenticity and then just, you know, it's authentic to realism. It's a great representation of what it's like in real life. That's what I meant. I didn't mean like, yes, this is the be all end all definitive realism. That's not what I was saying. I'm saying, is it in the realistic realm? Does it portray what it's like to be fatigued? As a soldier, absolutely. I, st I still stand by the argument. It still represents what it would actually be like to be fatigued as an actual soldier in the field. But obviously those, you know, it's subject to change between different persons because there are some people who are more than capable. I've seen firsthand individuals who can carry, like they, they have a rucksack like this on their back and then they have another one strapped to the front of them. I've actually had to do that at one point. I had to carry a radio on my back and then my ruck on my front and it was just, well... Not exactly like that, but it was this really awkward configurement. You know, you're carrying your small pack on your back on the front of your stomach by wearing it backwards, essentially, and then you have your rucksack on your back with the radio in it. That's a lot of weight. I've had to do that, but can I run and fight effectively like that? Absolutely not. I would drop all that weight so I can efficiently engage targets and be maneuverable. How are you supposed to m move around if you're basically just like a walking tank? You know what I mean? Like in terms of your speed, maneuverability, you're just, you're really slow. You're you're over encumbered. For, you wouldn't. It's not even viable to get in a firefight that way. If I had a, like a small pack on my back or on my front, sorry, and a rucksack on my back with a radio in it, it's like, you know what I mean? It's just you got to realize the realities of what it actually is to be in. And I'm not trying to criticize people who are saying otherwise, because there are soldiers out there who have been also commenting on this, saying that yeah, no, it's unrealistic. Sway is ridiculous. It's like. At times, yes, this way can be ridiculous, but I just showed you. I just engaged a target at a kilometer away with 100% fatigue and 101% load. Like, it's it's feasible. You can do it. It's not impossible. I did it with the standard MX rifle. 6.5 millimeter round. And we haven't even touched on the stances yet. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so here's the building. You can see it's built on the side of a cliff, mountain, hill, whatever you want to call it. Most likely a hill or some small cliff. You'll see these houses, they exist, right? But right now, the way it's currently built, an architecture would go ahead and tell you that, okay, there's no support. There's no structural integrity there to actually maintain and hold up the weight that's actually hanging off the side of that little hill or cliff. So you introduce a girder. Now that it's in place, you can see it's adding additional structural integrity by absorbing all of the weights at the base of it. You could probably see where I'm going with this now at this point. 
that girder would essentially be your arm and that house would essentially be the weapon that entire little hill area would be your body so the adaptation you're seeing here is basically what it would be like if you were to rest your elbow inside your chest to support the weapon to some degree obviously making your stance a little bit altered to allow you to actually rest your elbow on your chest or on your tack vest or anywhere on your actual body where it's pretty much just sitting there and the weapon is resting naturally in your hand. Now if you take the original normal stance you will see most soldiers have which is portrayed in Arma 3, this is how it would look. You ask any architect if that's a viable way of creating structural integrity and they will tell you no, that just looks retarded. The other way is the more superior way of actually being able to absorb all of the weight. So naturally, when you're looking at this, this is how you hold your weapon. You're, there is no support. But the thing is, we have muscles. We, you know, we, we are not lifeless static objects that are incapable of providing counter force to actually exert and distribute the weight in a different type of way. This is why you're always told to pull your weapon into your shoulder and then to pull it up. Doing this helps to alleviate the downward weight that's added at the front of your weapon whenever you're actually holding it in this position. Pulling it into your shoulder and up helps to distribute using extra force. You're basically shifting the weight to your shoulder so your body's going to absorb most of it. But of course, you're also activating muscle groups which are to being able to allow you to exert that force into your chest. That's how you basically stabilize a weapon and make it so you can shoot straighter and have more control when firing rounds, you know, compensating for recoil if you're firing fully automatic, etc. Look how he's holding his weapon, right? There is no resting of any sort when he's holding the weapon. And this is a very important factor, right? Every Even when he's crouching, he's not resting. Like, in real life, I was crouching. I'd probably be doing something like... Okay, yeah, it, it's, it's not obviously right on his knee, but something like that, right? I'd be a little bit lower. Okay, not that low. <laughs> but you know what? I'd be lower and I'd be resting. My arse would actually be sitting on the back of my heel. And my elbow would be on my knee basically giving me some additional support the stance that's actually adopted in armor 3 isn't that he's holding supporting the entire weapon with just his arms and upper body so those of you who are saying like yeah i can't remain accurate or whatever you got to realize there are some ways naturally that you will try to compensate for that additional sway and you may not even be aware of it and that's just the reality of it because there are a lot of times when if i'm super tired really exhausted and I'm firing from the standing like this, I will typically, like, I can't show you, but basically I would rest my left elbow, for example, on my actual chest. So I would actually bring that into my chest so that it's basically, instead of it being like, you know, my shoulder, my elbow being floating out in the air, my elbow is supported against my own chest and I'm basically turning my weapon a little bit more this way. So I'd be aiming more over there instead of over here because you're turning your weapon this way and you're bringing your shoulder or your elbow in so you can rest it on your chest to give to alleviate some of the weight of the weapon to help you actually stabilize your shot a little bit more the thing is you're adopting your stance the stances that are actually portrayed in this game the sway would technically be realistic to what you're currently feeling obviously it's a little bit bouncy right there's no like look at this this is insane right it's you're looking at that but you got to realize the magnification of this site if i were to remove the site and then aim down. I look like I can engage targets a little bit better. You know what I mean? I look like I can... There you go. Just drop that target. Two shots. Like, it's... It seems easier to hit targets... When you're not having a magnification sight. Because you gotta realize... When you're magnified... And this is for people who obviously aren't military personnel. Because, you know, people who fire weapons with... Anybody who's fired a weapon with a sight will know that what the exaggerate like the amount of movement is incredibly exaggerated when you're looking down your sight. Because when you're here, it's like, okay, yeah, that's it. I, I can see everything in my peripheral vision. It's just, you know, it's that. Exactly that. But once I add a scope to my, you know, some kind of high magnification weapon sight to my weapon and I look down it, naturally, the surface area that you're looking at, it's, it's going to be extent like, the hell's the word I'm trying to think of? It's basically going to be exaggerated. The movements that you do will be far more exaggerated. So, aiming from here, you know what I mean? Like, with a... I gotta put this in perspective. Okay, so if I'm aiming 
down my sight. Just a simple weapon sight. We're gonna drop this just so my fatigue can recover. Oops. Okay, there we go. Alright, so if I'm crouching or skin the prone to minimize the sway, I'm aiming here, right? If I'm aiming at a target a kilometer away, like that guy way the hell out there, which you can barely see me, he's a tiny little blue dot right above my iron sight. Yeah, I'm aiming at him. Yeah, even though it looks like my crosshair, even though it looks like my iron sight is technically over top of him, my round's not going to hit him, even if I change the elevation of my sight. So, you know, I put it to... Okay, well, it goes up to 600 meters. So, I put it to 600. If I were to try to engage him from here... Yeah, it sure, it looks like because of my perception that just because my iron sight's over top of him, theoretically it would hit. But if I were to actually add scope into the equation, like a weapon sight, and actually get closer... Right? Aim significantly closer to that guy. There, now you'll see that the sway... It's more exaggerated, right? Even though my weapon sight may have been over top of him, I could have been off by that much. Or that much. Because I'm looking at a target that's really tiny in the distance, but my iron sight is this big bulky thing directly in front of me. There could be so many meters to either side of that target that you have no idea you're actually aiming over top of just because the iron sight is so bulky it's completely blocking your perception or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. It's way the hell out there. Actually, wait. What am I doing? Do that. That hit his PCML. Just got hit again. And the Twitch animations are getting shot. It just looks so funny. And that they're just retarded. And now he's dead. Over a kilometer. You know, like that's. I don't know. People saying. I, I would have a feeling that people wouldn't be complaining nearly as much if you can actually rest your weapon on the ground. So, if I'm firing from the prone, I would be putting the magazine on the ground. I would be stabilizing my shot like that. You gotta realize there's no weapon resting. And if there was, I guarantee you most people wouldn't be as annoyed with the system right now because you would be able to actually put your weapon down and stabilize your shot. Where, right now, none of that is in the game. And one person brought that up. None of that is in the game as it stands right now. There is no... There is no weapon stabilization system in place. You can get mods for it. But once Bohemia, if they added that, like, you know, officially, I'm in the ground, like this, like I rest my magazine on the ground, etc. Rest it on a cover in front of me, whatever the case may be. It would stabilize your shot significantly more. And that's something that you need to factor in. Because even like this, there would be sway. Right? You're rolling on your elbows, whatever the case may be. You know, uneven ground, un you know, uncomfortable, painful rocks digging into your elbows, whatever the case may be, that's, that's just the reality of it. So hopefully, hopefully this kind of explains to you guys a little bit more in depth what I was referring to, what exactly I was talking about when I was talking about the fatigue system and the realism aspect of it. I'm not saying, in conclusion, I'm not saying it's absolutely 100% the real thing, because there are many factors, many factors, you know, for people's specific level of fitness. You know, the amount of weight and gear you're carrying, the weapon sight, the weapon you're firing, there's a lot of factors, and as it stands right now, I think it's hovering in the realm of realism. It's realistic enough, I think it's a good representation of what it's like in the real world. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Hopefully that'll alleviate some of the questions. There, I have no doubt there will be some criticisms and questions coming in from you guys, so by all means, shoot. I will be trying to answer them as best I can. Other people are out there who know firsthand, chime in. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's an ongoing debate, and it's really hard to, to determine what is and what isn't the most accurate and correct way of portraying realism in a video game. So, my name is Pepper Belly. Thank you guys for joining me today, and I'll see you guys on the next one.